Um, so hello everybody, my name is Katie, uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am one of the co-chairs of the University of Edinburgh Staff Pride Network for LGBT plus colleagues and allies. Um, today's event is to mark World AIDS Day this year. Um, it's something that we have um, tried to mark as a network um, over a number of years, and this year is particularly poignant um, given um, the current pandemic that we're living in and how it impacts people living with HIV and AIDS around the world. And so that is the, the primary goal for today's session. And um, I will hand you over shortly to our host, our main host, to um, tell you more about the event itself. Um, I'm here as your friendly reminder for any technical requirements. If at the moment, while somebody else is speaking, can you please keep your microphone muted? but feel free to have your video on if you're comfortable. We love to see your faces and it's really heartening to see people joining us from all around the, the, the world today. Um, so yes, keep your microphone muted while someone else is speaking. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself in the chat, um, you can use the form that I have just used. So share your name, your pronouns, where you're joining us from, what brings you here today. It'd be great to hear these things from everybody that's watching. Um, and that just leaves me to hand you over into the very capable hands of Edgar, who is our research officer at the Staff Pride Network to tell you more about today's two days event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. And I am very happy to introduce this incredible group of speakers who have been kind enough to be with us today in this important day and they are going to talk about how the COVID-19 crisis is affecting in particular people who are living with HIV and the theme of this year's World AIDS Day is resilience and hopefully we will get to hear some wonderful stories of resilience of individuals and communities who are experiencing these difficult times. However, I've been warned by some of the speakers that perhaps some of the, some of the stories that we will hear will be a bit difficult because of the different context in which we are living. And hopefully we will get a um, um, diversity of of experiences here. So I want to introduce the first of our speakers. He is Robert Pollock. Robert is a health improvement coordinator at Waverly Care. He is based in Edinburgh, currently working from home. He has been part of Waverly Care since 1995, initially as a befriending volunteer and since 2011 as a paid employee. He works in a small team offering outreach support to people living with HIV and or hepatitis C. This team has worked throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, offering a blend of in-person and telephone support and advice. Thank you very much, Robert, for being here. And the microphone is yours. Thanks, Edgar. Um, good evening, everyone. As Edgar said, my name is Robert Pollock, and my pronouns are he and him. Um, I'm a coordinator, one of five, in the health improvement team at Waverley Care, and we cover the east side of Scotland. Um, we provide more intensive outreach support to around 212 people living with HIV and or hepatitis C in the Lothians and Fife. And we also have projects in Glasgow, Lanarkshire, Forth Valley, Argyll and Butte and Highlands. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened um, as a result of COVID-19 lockdown and how it impacts the services that we've been providing. So we went into lockdown at the end of March along with everyone else. And at that point, we suspended all of our regular in-person um, support at home, in the community and at the Waverly Care locations. In its place, we've been offering regular telephone support, text support and video contact. Um, in addition to the, the um, remote support, we've also been offering a, 
a doorstep service, which is to support people sourcing and the delivery of essential items, um, which includes uh, medication, um, antiretrovirals and controlled medications that people need on a regular basis. Um, one of the things that we've had to do as a result of COVID-19 is extend our reach. So we're now working in neighbouring regions, including Perthshire and the Scottish borders. Um, fortunately, um, in the team that I work in, only a small number of our clients have become infected with COVID-19, um, which is good to hear. And so far, all have recovered. Um, the, the one challenge that I guess will resonate for, for most of us is mental health and the impact of mental health has been significant on the people that we serve. Um, and it's probably going to become clearer as we're able to support more people in person um, as the restrictions start to get lifted. Um, we've seen people struggling to cope with the pressures of lockdown and in turn, this, had a marked, this has had a marked impact on their ability to cope with other pressures such as their housing or their finances their addictions, relationships, and isolation. Um, for some of our clients who tested positive in the, the 1980s and 1990s, seeing healthcare staff in PPE again has had a bit of a triggering effect, reminding them of the dark days in their life when um, they originally tested positive and the discrimination that they felt at that time. Um, we are also finding that people who in normal times would be more supported with regular community contact and attendance of groups, regular friend and family contact are being tipped into social isolation and the demand for our befriending service and um, other referrals has increased as a result of that. Um, there have been practical challenges. Um, many of our clients have been instructed to shield as part of the first lockdown. Um, and during that time, um, there were challenges around, you know, being able to buy and get enough food, um, being able to top up your electricity. Not everyone we support gets a bill, they, they have to top it up at the local shop. Um, paying bills, collecting medication and accessing healthcare. We've endeavoured to help with as much of that as possible. Um, part of that has been, um, helping people to keep connected. And we were fortunate enough um, in May this year to receive £18,000 from a combination of the Scottish Government Welfare Fund and the National Lottery. And we've used that to um, provide small grants to a number of our clients. Um, and that's allowed them to buy the food that they need, um, pay for the electricity and gas that they're spending more money on because they're spending more time at home, buy clothing, pay for transport, um, pay for more for top-ups for telephone and broadband, because as we know, everyone's spending a lot more time on broadband than the telephone these days. And we've also been able to help people who aren't connected to become connected. So we've um, been able to buy a, a number of people laptops or tablet PCs or um, smartphones to help them get connected for the first time. So that's been very useful. Um, some of the, the um, emerging needs that we've noticed as a result of um, the, the changes are, you know, people from around Scotland have been reaching out for support, not just in our local areas. So we've now been able to provide that support um, to those more remote areas using Zoom in a way that we didn't before. We were more restricted by um, people's um, proximity to our offices, and now we can provide that support across the country using technology. Um, I think that's something that when the COVID pandemic is, is over, that we won't be letting go of. We'll hold on to that. Um, mm -hmm. Challenges for the future, apart from COVID, um, stigma continues to be one of our biggest challenges, continues to blight the lives of people living with HIV, and it conspires to discourage people at risk of HIV from getting tested. We need to keep talking about HIV encourage people to know their status and to test regularly as part of regular sexual health screening. Um, we need to ensure access to PrEP and PEP where possible and where required. 
and we need to provide more opportunities um, for people to test, whether that's home testing or home sampling. Um, and we also need to call out discrimination whenever we hear it. Um, it's important that we work collaboratively, um, including other service users, um, service providers, people living with HIV and people at risk. And um, finally, I would just like to thank Edgar and the Staff Trade Network for inviting me to be part of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. And now we are moving to our next speaker. We are going to listen to Socorro Garcia Estrada. Socorro is a psychologist graduated from the National University of Mexico. She is a psychotherapist and thanatologist. She delivers person-centered awareness training for medical staff on topics of care for people living with HIV and has 25 years of experience providing psychological orientation to people living with HIV. She is part of the Citizen Council on HIV in Mexico City and is program director at La Casa de la Sal, a civil association that provides comprehensive care for people with HIV and AIDS and their families. Socorro, es tu turno. Si pudieras eh, eh, hacer alguna pausa de, eh, para que pueda hacer la, la traducción, te lo agradeceré mucho. Gracias. Estás en, en mute. Si puedes activar tu micrófono. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Es un honor para nosotras estar aquí con ustedes. La Casa de la Sal tiene 34 años de estar trabajando en el acompañamiento psicológico de personas con VIH. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be here. La Casa de la Sal is an association that has 34 years of experience providing services to people living with HIV. En estos años hemos atendido a muchas personas, hombres que tienen sexo con hombres, en la mayor, de la población mayoritariamente hablando, pero también nos hemos abocado a la atención de familias, mujeres y niños con VIH. During these years, our most um, prominent population has been men who have sex with men. However, they have also foc focused on women and children. Eh, lo que más nos caracteriza en México es que tenemos un albergue para niños, niñas y adolescentes y que eh, tenemos dos clínicas psicológicas desde que se fundó Casa de la Sal. One of the distinctive, distinctive qualities of Casa de la Sal is that they have a shelter for uh, women and their families and children and that, what, ¿cuál, va, ¿cuál va a ser la última parte, Socorro? Nos caracterizamos mucho por tener el apoyo psicológico a través Ajá. de dos clínicas. Uh, and they have uh, psychological support through two clinics. Bueno, algo muy importante dentro de esta eh, pandemia del COVID-19 es que ha golpeado eh, severamente a poblaciones que son doble o triplemente vulnerables, como son las mujeres y los niños. One of the most difficult challenges of COVID-19 is that it has hit do, uh, people who have been doubled or tripled that have that have three or two vulnerabilities and estamos viviendo con el confinamiento niveles muy altos de violencia que socialmente vulneran más a las mujeres y a las niñas. We are going through moments of violence, which are making women and, and girls more vulnerable to this situation. Recientes estudios, eh, además de que ha aumentado estadísticamente la violencia en las mujeres, se ha marcado mucho en las niñas una doble eh, jornada de trabajo que no nada más es el cuidarse a sí mismas, sino cuidar a los hermanos y al resto de la familia. 
dado Recent, que la mamá en ocasiones tiene que salir a trabajar. Recent studies have shown that statistically speaking, uh, women and particularly girls have been uh, hit by this situation because they are now facing two jobs, like focusing on their, their, their studies and also focusing on taking care of their brothers, their siblings, taking care of the, the, their families. Además del de altísimo índice de eh, eh, violencia sexual que se está registrando dentro de las familias, que seguramente esto podrá eh, reflejarse en un aumento del VIH. Unfortunately, there has been also um, uh, an increase in sexual violence towards, towards girls who, um, and this is something that she is envisioning as, as something that will have consequences in new HIV diagnosis. Una de nuestras principales preocupaciones es el desabasto que hay en los medicamentos la falta de atención en esta temporada de las personas que tienen alguna enfermedad oportunista por el VIH. One of our biggest concerns is the lack of medications and the opportunistic infections that might come as related to HIV because of pero the COVID-19. Pero más se ve reflejado en la falta de atención en, en niños, niñas y adolescentes. But this is reflected even further on children and adolescents. En el mes de mayo, en el estado de, eh, del norte, en varios estados del norte del país, se caracterizan por ser estados conservadores. Eh, han estado promoviendo algo que se llama PIN parental. Surgió en España y aquí en México se está adoptando. Um, in various states of the north of the country, there have been, uh, which these states are characterized by a uh, conservative government. They have adopted um, a law or a policy that is called PIN parental, which comes from Spain, but has been adopted in Mexico as well. PIN parental. Eh, promueve que solamente los padres de familia son los que pueden hablar de educación sexual a los hijos, dejando una laguna enorme de posibilidades para trabajar asociaciones civiles y personal médico la prevención del VIH. Pin parental es una ley que state states that only parents, only families are allowed to educate uh, their children on sexual education and they are tying civil organizations hands to act or to support um, sexual education or to provide sexual educa education to people who need it. Esto hace que, por ejemplo, los eh, adolescentes no puedan tener acceso a una prueba rápida, aunque ya hayan iniciado su vida sexual activa. Tienen que ser acompañados por un adulto, por su padre o su tutor. This means that adolescents who might have initiated um, a sexual life, they can't access a rapid test for HIV because they need to be accompanied by their parents and civil associations can't do this for them. They can't support them in this. No tienen acceso a la, al área de eh, salud reproductiva. Recordemos que México es el país número uno con embarazos adolescentes y con violencia sexual hacia los menores de edad. They don't have access either to health, reproductive health. And she is reminding us that Mexico is number one country in teenage pregnancies and sexual violence towards young, young women. Entonces, estos son algunos de los retos más inmediatos que tenemos la sociedad civil 
para poder dar una respuesta inmediata a la prevención del VIH y a la atención integral de quienes ya están viviendo con el VIH. So this is a massive challenge for civil associations, for civil society, um, as they are unable to to help in these situations where people need to get uh, tests for new diagnosis and also to support people who have been already diagnosed and um, being diagnosed with HIV. Otro reto relacionado con las mujeres es que en tanto estén embarazadas, aparecen en los modelos de intervención y en las acciones de respuesta al VIH, mujeres siempre y cuando que estén embarazadas. Um, Socorro, ¿podrías repetir esa parte? No sé si no me quedó muy, muy sí, claro. Las, eh, eh, el reto, por otra, por otra parte, el reto que tenemos con las mujeres es que solamente están contempladas en las acciones de prevención de VIH siempre y cuando estén embarazadas. Oh, so another challenge that is a massive one is that women are only contemplated in these um, health policies towards VIH, HIV if they are pregnant. La mayoría de las acciones están orientadas a HSHs. The vast majority of actions are oriented towards men who have sex with men. So women are left out of, this, of these policies. Y esto nos parece que está bien, pero también no se contempla a las mujeres heterosexuales que están siendo infectadas por su única pareja sexual. No so, hay campañas para esto. Mm -hmm. There are no campaigns for heterosexual women who have been who might be infected by their, their partners, their heterosexual partners. Además de que socialmente las mujeres tienden a ser, eh, eh, por cuestión cultural, las cuidadoras de la pareja o de los niños, dejándose ellas en último lugar. This is something that gets complicated even further because of cultural uh, practices amongst women, Mexican women, who are traditionally considered uh, the carers. They care for their families, they care for their, uh, their children and their, their partners, but they, they are the last ones to, um, they don't take care of themselves. Las mujeres son diagnosticadas o por su pareja que está eh, en fase de sida o por su bebé o cuando ellas ya están en fase de sida. So the scenario for women is that they are diagnosed when their partner is diagnosed already, when they are already in an AIDS phase, or they are diagnosed when their baby is born and is diagnosed with, with HIV. And they are, this means that there is a late diagnosis for women. Finalmente, eh, pensamos que el lema de este año, solidaridad mundial, responsabilidad compartida, tenemos una importante participación, la sociedad civil, para que esto cambie. So the, um, this year's, this year's uh, motto of global solidarity and shared responsibility means that there should be Precisely that, that shared responsibility and that solidarity to make these things change. Las mujeres y los niños son resilientes por sí mismos, pero necesitan acciones y cambio, incidencia política que los proteja y que les brinde una, un respeto a sus derechos humanos. Women are children, women and children are resilient individuals, but resilience in themselves in itself is not enough. We need so um, politi change, a change in politics that helps these broader social issues to change. Foros como estos nos da mucho gusto compartir 
eh, experiencias, porque sabemos que el rostro del VIH es el mismo en todo el mundo. Muchas gracias. She is um, happy to share these these findings or these um, realities in in these type of forums because these are necessary to to show that the face of HIV is the same everywhere and that we need to do something about it and and she thanks for uh, for being here and for allowing her to tell this this Well, thank you very much, and um, I'm sorry for the uh, the translation. I'm not a professional interpreter, I, but I hope that I managed to communicate the essence of Socorro's message. Our next our next speaker is Germán Martinez Blanco. Germán is an independent actor and psychologist, graduated from the National University of Mexico. Since 2003, he has worked in NGOs, coordinating community psychological care programs. Since 2010, he's, he has specialized in the HIV field, doing prevention, early detection, and accompaniment of people living with HIV. He currently coordinates the linkage to medical care program in AHF Mexico, and promotes the cabaret play entitled Lights Out with the Doom Cabaret Company. Germán, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Edgar, and thank you everybody for the invitation. I'm so glad and happy uh, for having me, you here among my colleagues and also uh, friends from Mexico and other uh, parts of the, uh, of the world. I believe that these uh, forums are very important where we have a broader and more global vision for the issues relevant of humanity. The community response in Mexico has been historically in the hands of NGOs, but most of them were financially dependent on government support. Very few organizations are financially independent. We do not have the culture of collection and sustainability that other organizations have in other countries. So in Mexico, the field of HIV came on alert since last year when the federal government eliminated funding for NGOs. The current government's fight against corruption considered simulation the work of all organizations and described them all as corrupt without distinction. So by the time COVID-19 arrived, community HIV care was already very weakness. In Mexico, treatment is provided by the government through the public health system. At the time of the lockdown, the first fight we had to attend was to get a ARB treatment for foreign nurse buried in our country foreign people who were obviously not affiliated with the health system and who is uh, often bureaucratic and inflexible. So we have to get the treatments from other users, I mean uh, patients and a few local health services that did understand the seriousness of the situation. We even had to create ingenious mechanisms to bring treatment closer to people living in very small rural communities who were unable to go to health services because of the lockdown. lockdown. And because the roads were also closed in their communities. These flexible and innovative services have always been NGOs initiatives that was named by the government as corrupt and as only simulators. The second step uh, during the 
this pandemic was to advocate for the health services to provide treatment for more than three months to avoid people having to go to hospitals every month. Although the initiative to give uh, treatments for several months has been a recommendation for the WHO for some years. In Mexico, these measures has not been generalized due to pressure from civil organizations. These measures was ordered from the federal agency in charge of the response to HIV, but it took months to be implemented throughout the country. At the same time, we attended short age, shortage reports in different areas of the country. In Mexico, we faced an ARB shortage crisis just last year. The Mexican health system is fragmented. There is one system for the unemployed, another for the employed people, another for the government employees, and one more for the armed forces. With the economic crisis deriv uh, derived from the health contingency, job layoffs began and we did the need for people to migrate from one health system to another. This implied bureaucracy, and it was not the health system that informed people about the way to migrate from one system to another. They simply announced that the service was no longer available for them, and people on their own had to ask or see how to continue their treatment. Once again, we were the organizations who, through communication strategies, informed the population and accompanied them in the process of things. Activists who were never locked off for continuing to support the communities have died. Trans women, sex workers have had to sleep on the street due to the closure of hotels. Finally, the crisis we now face is to get hospital beds for people with HIV who are going through a health crisis other than COVID-19, since all medical efforts are reserved and monopolized to address the issue of SARS-CoV-2. The CENCIDA, which is the governing institution of the response to HIV in Mexico, has coordinated work groups between health systems and organizations where we have made all these problems visible and the government has addressed some of them, but the response is, has not been as effective as we would like. However, we continue to work together, solving and preparing ourselves to receive winter and with it, a second wave of problems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Herman. Thank you for, for this presentation. And now we are going to welcome Rocio Sanchez Granillo Lopez. Rocio is a psychologist, psychotherapist, and PhD candidate in human sexuality. In her role as a lecturer at Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City, she supervises psychology trainees working with people living with HIV. As a result of this work, she co-founded Previene por tu Vida, an organization dedicated to deliver comprehensive sexual education programs on primary prevention of STIs, on planned pregnancies, and sexual health promotion. Rocio, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Edgar. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, Good afternoon here in Mexico. Good evening there. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you this, this day, this important day for us. A COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the enormous inequalities that we knew existed in our country. This health crisis is hitting the weakest and the most vulnerable people. COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated the challenges faced 
by people living with HIV, women and girls, and key populations. Among the great challenges that have been magnified is that related to accessing healthcare, which has, been, uh, which has become even more complex. In the same way, we have seen to what extent social and economic inequalities have increased the vulnerability to HIV of marginalized groups. However, the crisis is also intended to draw our attention to ACT. It presents us as Previene, as uh, our uh, association, an opportunity to do things in some different ways. In Mexico, we face great difficulties in carrying the population living with HIV. As a result of the pandemic, the government closed a large number of services, hospitals that provide care to this population were established as COVID hospitals and were limited in the rest of the services. Thus, leaving aside vulnerable population, such as people living with HIV. In Previene, our efforts are mainly focused on emotionally services to the population. We carry out emotional support groups at Clinica Condesa in Mexico, in Mexico City. However, due to the pandemic, these services were canceled. Based on our experience, we noticed that the people who came out to came to our groups um, had a great need for listening and psychological care and psychological support. Some of the phenomena were observed under, uh, they were uh, unemployment, uh, they uh, have couple breakups, even people have to return to their places of origin due to various circumstances. It's important to precise here that these uh, people came from conservative states here in Mexico City. So when they return to their places of origins, um, they find themselves in vulnerable situations since on many occasions their family were unaware of their diagnosis and did not know how to deal with these situations in front of them. They were, they were vulnerable to discrimination and violence. In addition to all of this, there is the situation of a shortage of medicine in the country which aggravated the emotional condition of the population living with HIV. Hence, we use the resources we have. And from um, August 2020, we carried out two strategies to get closer to the population. The first was to carry out the care, group, the care groups virtually. We establish contact with the people with whom we work regularly and through social media, we invited more people to join the groups. It is particularly important to mention that most of the population do not have internet access or it is deficient here in Mexico. So the most viable to tools for remote connection were sought for this population. Our second strategy was to launch a hotline in which we provide emotional care to the entire population of the Mexican Republic. If they can't connect the call, we call them back so they could have this attention remotely. We received calls from people uh, from 16 to 61 years old. This service solved the internet inaccessibility. The health crisis helped uh, focus more on basic health issues that are something neglected in this population, like nutrition, the adherence of treatment. We get the chance to work in a more introspective way in, with the population that we can have access. On the other hand, we also carry out campaigns promoting that people could, should seek HIV testing services from their healthcare provided of their own free will. This provides them an opportunity to confidentially, uh, confidentially explore and understand their HIV risks and to learn their HIV test results. The support network has worked in a positive way. 
we, uh, where they found a space for listening and support so they could rely on. This network even helped to set up in contact to many organizations or groups mentioned by Herman uh, to get their treatment. We have a special interest in supporting women since several factors intersect in this population, economic, gender, violence, and HIV status, among others. The challenges are still very great since the COVID-19 pandemic has not ended and we have new goals ahead, new, help, new goals ahead of us to meet. And as I said at the, be at the beginning, this health crisis has led us to do things in a different way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rocio. And our final speaker for tonight is Fraser Serle. Fraser is a member of HIV Scotland's Community Advisory Network and Lothian HIV Patient Forum. He was also vice chair of Positively UK in London until earlier this month. Fraser, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, to introduce myself, um, so yes, it was last month, the beginning of November. I wrote that um, in November, especially December today. And um, I'm feeling quite resilient, which means to me, resilience is about being able to cope. Um, and I'm gonna talk quite personally about my experience. I can't speak for everyone in Scotland with HIV or across the British Isles, um, but it links to um, how I felt supported and able to cope uh, primarily because of HIV Scotland and what they provided for me. At the start of the pandemic, I was working in London. I work in public health and I was in London, although I lived in Edinburgh, and I'd spend half the week in one city and half the week in the other city. And I stayed in London um, from early March. I was sent home from work by our director of public health because of my HIV status, because at that time we weren't sure whether I was high risk of COVID and getting, if I got it, if I was going to become ill, and we've learned more as we've gone along. Um, but working from home in your bedroom is very difficult. It's very difficult to cope because you can't switch off. Now, I was very fortunate because the woman I rented the room from, we had a garden, so I could go out into the garden. Um, there was a park nearby with swans and we were watching as the eggs hatched from the swan's nest and stuff like that, which was beautiful as a way to help us cope. And um, we listened to the radio and dance on a Friday night, which was great. Um, however, I was isolated from my family and I was working really hard and I couldn't escape from work. And HIV Scotland opened a whole programme of work with phone calls, um, so opportunities to speak to people. And therefore I was able to see people face to face, which to me was really important and talk to other people with HIV. So there's certain things that you want to be able to talk to people about. And I was in a, a session earlier about um, if people have the same background or same issue as you, there's some things you can say and they just understand. And that's really, really important. And what was great at the beginning of the pandemic, my clinic in Edinburgh phoned me up. One of the nurses gave me a phone call and said, hi Fraser, how are you? I just want to check you're okay. Um, have you got enough medication and all this sort of stuff and I think that's really really important that your treatment centers were phoning us up to say are you okay so halfway through the pandemic um, I couldn't stay in London anymore um, and I came home to Edinburgh because I was working from a room in London and actually I wanted to work from a room back in Edinburgh because it meant I was nearer my family um, and again I was very fortunate because I had a garden where I was staying and there was a park nearby with a big loch and there was birds and swans and things like that to say. And I think this is the key thing um, for me with this pandemic, pandemic is it's we all can cope with things differently and it's what's there. And I took every opportunity that I was given, but that's because I felt confident enough to do it. Um, I needed pushing at time uh, and someone to say, hey, come on, get out. So. It was very easy to lie in my bed a lot of the time and not get up. And when you're lying down, you're thinking about the worst. And many people I've I noticed don't have that sort of motivation and support um, to do that sort of thing. I was staying with someone 
who had lived through this HIV from the beginning, has been HIV positive for a long time, lost various partners and friends to HIV, has had cancer twice. And they were like, throw it all at me. And it's about, again, it's uh, everyone copes with things differently. And so for me, in terms of World AIDS Day and why this is, is in, in international is because it's, we've lived through one pandemic before we've, and we're here with this something again. I think this is, as you say, it's, it's thrown out inequalities, but our, our resilience is within ourselves. And I think it's about saying to people, it's okay to feel rubbish. People are really shocked that I was really not coping at times. Um, however, it's, being able to know that they can go through the door. So that's why it's really great that people are here from different places, knowing that there's Waverly Care and the things that so people there are experiencing. Because for me, what this pandemic has highlighted is many people still don't understand. They think HIV is sorted because it's medication and people can live well, but actually it's really, really difficult. And there's a big stigma there for lots of people living with HIV. So I just want to say, um, for me, um, any opportunity to talk about what's going on is really, really important to share and to help people understand that um, HIV hasn't gone away. Um, COVID-19 COVID sort of highlighted inequalities, but HIV still has inequalities. It still affects certain communities more than others. And there's still the stigma associated with HIV. I think what's interesting, my sister had COVID and a friend of her sent her a bunch of flowers um, for having COVID. And I said, oh, no one ever sent me a bunch of flowers for having HIV, which is slightly cheeky. But I just think in terms of how people view things, in terms of there's still the judgment. If you have HIV, it's your own fault. Um, with COVID, we don't know. Um, I'm hoping that um, longer term, this will make people think more carefully about how they treat people with HIV. And it's a great opportunity. So that, that's really just what I want to say, because I wasn't sure what I was going to say tonight. Um, and the reason I've said I was, um, I was actually involved in a lot of things at the beginning of COVID. I was helping write uh, questionnaires for UK CAB and the European Chemsex Forum. I was volunteering with the Gay Men's Health Collective, and we used a lot of information from HIV Scotland for our website and stuff. But one of them, I think, and I was a vice chair of Positively UK, which is a UK advocacy charity. But I realised for me to be able to cope with this winter, I had to step back from my resilience. And so what I'm saying to everyone is self-care is really important. And someone living with HIV, I decided just to focus on my world with HIV Scotland and Lothian HIV Patient Forum because it's too much to do, too, too much. So I say to all my colleagues, if you're struggling, take a step back, look at what you're doing and leave some things behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fraser. And now we are moving on to um, the Q and A session. Yes. Uh, thank. Thank you so much uh, to to all of our uh, panel members uh, this evening for for what's been a, a really informative. Uh, and enlightening discussion um, and also sharing your, your experiences as well as uh, perspectives on how COVID-19 uh, has affected individuals living with HIV AIDS and the, the many challenges that, that we face over, over the, the, the coming months and years. Um, uh, I, I should say just uh, as a quick introduction, uh, my name's David, my pronouns are he, him, and uh, I serve as co-social and events officer on the Staff Pride Network. Um, so yes, yeah, thank you to all of the panel members. Um, I think with that said, now we, we have time for uh, questions and comments from the audience. Um, you can feel free to turn on uh, your microphone, um, your video, if you're happy to do so and ask, uh, ask questions directly, or you can also um, choose to uh, pop uh, a note of any questions or comments you might have in the chat, and I would be happy to, to um, read those on, on your behalf.
I'll ask something. Oh, Robbie's just said, I'll let Robbie go first. Oh, yes. Uh, Robbie has uh, just asked, do you think COVID um, is likely to take funding away from HIV services? Um, I was just going to, to, to say, um, Edgar, as well, if, you, if you'd like to, to come on, um, just, just to ensure that, that we uh, are, are uh, translating the, the, the questions as well. Um, if, if any of the panel members would like to like to answer that. Um, Robert, you, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I would say definitely, and it already has. A lot of the HIV agencies are charities and they rely on a mix of um, raised funds and um, funds from government and, um, and other um, sources. And because of COVID, the opportunity to raise funds for those those charities has been restricted, so it has already had an impact on the, the services that we offer to people living with HIV and hepatitis C, and um, that's happened already. And does, does any anyone else uh, on the panel uh, w w want to to comment on 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 that? Uh, I think so, some of you already uh, spoke about um, funding in relation to HIV services. Uh, already, but if anyone uh, wanted to raise raise their hand or if they have anything to add, um, please do feel free to, to to let me know. Yes, I I think that uh, as Robert said, uh, COVID has already taken funding and taken services. We now are struggling with no beds for the HIV patients who needed it in Mexico. And well, we are fighting not to be like without funding, but it's already taken. Hmm. Yes, and, uh, and Katie, if, if uh, you want to, to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Yeah, I suppose it's slightly related to funding and also um, the, the notion of support for things like HIV. And it, I think what Fraser said around the stigma, um, that example of someone getting a bunch of flowers for getting COVID, but nobody gets you a bunch of flowers if you if you've got HIV, what, what, how do we change people's minds about, about the stigma? Um, yeah. Um, it's a difficult one because the stigma, because I made a joke to my, when my sister told me, she said, oh, I just said, oh, no, give me any of those. And we laughed. But it was kind of awkward as well, because um, um, I came out to my family, um, actually primarily thanks to stuff because I became a peer mentor and then I did some work with HIV Scotland and two years ago at World Aids Day they issued a book called Disclosures and I used it as a way of coming out to the rest of my family about my status, um, which was quite good. Um, but I didn't feel stigma as such until I was told I had stigma. So it's felt stigma from Goffman, because I remember studying that, um, I'm reading about stigma and people, I think it's, uh, so it's, because I, I, I do stuff with my word association. So if I see stigma and HIV in the same sentence, I'll read them together. Whereas, because um, that's very, very visual. Um, but everyone has stigma. And I, it's hard because I was at a thing last week and really, really obese people have stigma that means they don't do stuff. So we all carry stigmas about ourselves that people don't know. Um, I think it's about those, I, I wish there was more people out about the status who are famous. I think that would be one of the key things for me. It's a bit like there's no gay footballers in Scotland, out gay footballers, um, certainly gay male ones anyway. And so I think there was, if more people who are uh, in positions well-known who were HV positive were out about the status, I think that would help massively. Just to pick up on that, it, it also 
brings me to thoughts I was having when both Soko and Rocio were talking about women and also children being affected by this. You know, that's something I've not thought about at all, really, I don't think, in my very privileged position as a cis white woman. It's not something I worry about because I don't, I'm not in, a, I'm, a, I'm middle class, I'm not in a position where I might be at risk. And I think it's, you know, I'm now thinking, you know, other people like me needs to learn this and that it's affecting women as well. Because I think it, you know, when we silo an issue as only affecting a certain group of people. And Fraser, when you mention, you know, famous people who are out at, with their status, the only ones I can think about are men. Um, and there must be women out there as well that are more, you know, high profile. I, I think the stigma is maybe slightly, we're maybe behind. Um, I don't know if Rocio wants to talk a bit more around that or Soko as well. Yes, I, I think, I'm sorry, Katie. It's okay. Yes, I, I think that uh, um, the, um, the stigma came from the, 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 the culture, but also is related about sexuality and how we live sexuality, right? We can uh, put it to get, uh, apart, sexuality and HIV. So, uh, as Soko said, uh, heterosexual women think, oh, I only have one partner, so I'm free. I'm, I'm not in a risk, maybe, no? Or um, I, I don't have any problem because I, I am a good woman, no? I, I am a good person and it's, it's not on me. I, I, I'm, I'm not dealing with HIV. Yeah, so HIV is related with promiscuous, uh, with uh, LGTB community. And, oh, it's a punishment. It's something for do something wrong. Yes, so uh, the, the, uh, uh, socially we have to change these, these thoughts. We have to change the way we see and we learn and we teach about sexuality. That is why we in, in Previene, we are very interested in give to children and adolescents and adults comprehensive education in sexuality. Because it is in all these levels where we, we must incite and we must do a change. That is my, my point of view, Katie. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rocio, for that. Um, I, I see that there's uh, some more activity in the, uh, in the, the chat. Um, Chloe, Chloe asks uh, um, a particular question for, for Rocio Soko and Herman. Uh, are there any public figures in, in Mexico who are out about their uh, HIV status um, and using their, their public platform to to raise awareness, um, and uh, Chloe, Chloe has uh, just clarified here uh, public figures at a uh, national level. Not that I know of, Herman. Do you? No, there are not. And recently, uh, we have uh, faced some kind of a scandal because an, a famous actor was appointed as a HIV positive uh, person. And the first thing he said is, no, 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 I am not. And we have no response, uh, not even if he is or not uh, an, an HIV positive, but no, we, we don't have like, we have allies. We have some people uh, being advocates, but no uh, famous people disclosuring the, their status. Socorro, uh, ah, sí. Sí, comentarles que lo que ha sucedido en el acompañamiento con niños en cuanto a la discriminación y el estigma, hemos observado que cuando son niños son acogidos, abrazados, protegidos, pero llegando a la adolescencia es cuando viven eh, más la discriminación. She's referring to a previous question and she's saying that something she's observed in her work is that children are embraced and they are uh, 
looked after in a more positive way when they are children uh, with, uh, with an HIV positive status, but as they grow up, they, that, that sense of uh, that positive attitude towards them disappears as they grow up. Adolescentes nos preguntan, se sorprenden, por qué antes eran cuidados y por qué después ahora son discriminados. And as adolescents, they ask, they ask, how is it possible that before we were looked after and we were taken care of and now we are discriminated and looked in a negative way? Pensamos que lo que sucede es que nos enfrentamos a un tabú que es la sexualidad. Y en sociedades como la mexicana, que es de doble moral, es un caldo de cultivo perfecto para la transmisión del VIH, la doble moral. Mm -hmm. She is saying that, um, um, that eh, alguno de los mexicanos, ¿cómo se traduce doble moral? <laughs> Double standard. Double standards. See, uh, that there is a double standard in Mexican society and that is associated to sexuality that um, when children are, when as, as children as, or uh, even as babies, they are seen as asexual beings, then they are not uh, discriminated by, uh, or stigmatized, but as sexuality emerges, then the, the stigma arises. And this is something associated to double standards in Mexican society. Finalmente, mi comentario es cómo, cómo confrontar, cómo abatir la discriminación eh, entre otras acciones, es el testimonio, es el acompañamiento entre pares, es dar visibilidad a las personas que viven, que tienen el VIH y que son como cualquiera y que tienen derechos y que tienen un proyecto de vida, a fuerza de hacerlos visibles. She's, she's mentioning that visibility is a key aspect of changing social attitudes towards HIV, because the more uh, people give testimony of being HIV positive, the more people talk about it and is visible and is uh, spoken about, the more we would change attitudes towards HIV. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think uh, just... Uh, I, I'm conscious, uh, Robert and Fraser, if, if you have uh, anything to, to add on, on this particular question, perhaps uh, uh, making this one a little bit uh, broader uh, about public figures here in Scotland and in the UK, um, and if there's anyone in particular that, that's been using their public uh, platform uh, recently to, to, to raise awareness. Not particularly using their public platform to raise awareness, but there are public figures that are, are positive and out. So we've got a member of the House of Lords, and we've got um, you know pop stars that are positive. Um, you don't necessarily make a big thing of it. It's just a matter of fact that they are they happen to be positive. Um, going back to the point on stigma and how do we challenge stigma, and um, I think. Um, schools have a large part to play in that and, um, you know, secondary education, sexual health education at schools. Um, we tried to do some work in that area. Um, some schools are more receptive than others. I think it's an important way to, 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 to teach people about HIV, which hasn't gone away, it's still very much there, but also to challenge um, preconceptions about what that means in 2020. Yes, uh, absolutely, Robert. I think you're you're totally right. Um, Fraser, do you have do you have anything you would like to to add there? I think it's the point. It's like about I think it's really good about women. The visibility of women is really key. So, positively, UK was positively women for many years, and our CEOs are women, and um, and and it is very important because women are usually much more disempowered than men, um, and we worked with and we worked with the, like a lot of african women in particular just about i think part of the challenge is because the medical profession uh, and medical model um it's very 
male led and it's like and we live in patriarchal societies so there was um just before um covid well actually it was, no during whilst covid was there because it was a, a feature on radio 4 about met vaginal mesh and all these different cases and women go to the house of lords and sort of um and women not being listened to and african women had said for years in the uk that they felt the hiv medication was making them put on weight and they were dismissed for this by white male doctors and actually it's found out to be true and it's the whole thing about the power imbalance is really really massive and i think that's one of the key things that we have to recognize and hence with covid and who's able to cope with it we've seen in britain that um certain communities cope less uh, being able to cope less and have worse impacts from from it but um it's personal decision on whether to come out but um i think it's just sometimes if you've got privilege and power it's something if you could use it for good it would be great thanks very much uh fraser i think uh there i see that there's two more questions uh that i'd quite like to ask um uh just just kind of following up uh with uh robert and fraser um Chloe, Chloe asks, is there still much uh, active misinformation being pushed in Scotland by, by uh, religious or uh, other lobby groups? Yes, Robert. Not so much. No, I'm not aware of misinformation, but possibly a lack of information. So Waverly Care, um, with funding from the Scottish Government, produced um, a campaign a few years ago called Always Here, and they created a pack for schools that went out to every, should have gone out to every school in the UK. However, um, that didn't, um, that wasn't well received by every RC school. So religion had a big part to play in how that information was disseminated to, mm. to kids in that case. Um, and I also think that religious, religious um, leaders and pastors do have part to play in encouraging people to um, to get tested and to to stay up to date on on where HIV currently is in terms of um, what's what's available and and what it means to have a, a positive diagnosis in 2020. There's a lot of information that was put out there in the early um, in, the, in the early start part of the, um, the HIV pandemic and uh, people haven't kept up to date. So a lot of people have information that's out of date and they're not aware of how things have progressed. They're not aware of U equals U and um, how HIV is now um, a, a, a manageable illness much in the same way that diabetes is a, a long-term manageable illness. In fact, HIV is probably less bothersome than, than diabetes. I'll just say yes, I, I agree on that, on that last one very much so. Um, HIV Scotland's just launched a campaign and it's fronted by a couple of famous Scottish celebrities, one of whom is Lorraine Kelly, who does TV Morning Show, and then Alan Cumming, and uh, we can send there's links to them, but it's basically letting people in Scotland know that how you can and can't get HIV, because there's just, as you say, there's lack of information and misinformation, and people get their news from their friends and other stuff and it's like where's the reliable source so HV Scotland have literally this week just launched a, a media campaign because there actually hasn't been a national advertising campaign about HIV awareness in Scotland since the British government ran one in the 1980s so um, there's been nothing so it's one that's a lack of information is a key thing yeah I think I think it, it, by the sense of it that, that that's a that's a challenge that that, uh, that we, we, we need to address. Um, I'm conscious I, I uh, skipped over one, one of the questions. Jonathan, um, you, you asked, so I'm just scrolling to, uh, to get this. So uh, Jonathan has uh, commented that it's been reported in the UK that, that PrEP and COVID have uh, reduced transmission significantly. Um, and Jonathan uh, asks if, if, if PrEP is commonly available in Mexico and have transmission levels uh, reduced due to uh, PrEP and due to COVID. Um, I see, uh, Herman, you're shaking your head. Would you like to, to uh, come in and comment on this? Yeah, um, we are still like stuck in the, um, we don't have the PrEP available 
in Mexico, but it seems like a few hours ago, uh, one of the systems, health systems announced that it would be available for now and, and on, but I need to confirm that. Uh, but no, we, we, we don't have PrEP uh, in Mexico. Okay, thank, thank you very much for, for confirming. Uh, Soko, uh, if you, you would like to come in and uh, Edgar. Respecto a la eh, religiosos, eh, si ya han afectado la percepción sobre el VIH, por supuesto que sí han afectado significativamente por el prejuicio de la sexualidad. Eh, en Casa de la Sal me ha tocado acompañar a varios sacerdotes y religiosas que viven con VIH y resulta mucho más complejo para ellos el vivirlo, el ir por su medicamento y el ocultarse tanto en la sociedad como en su grey, en su religión. Responding to a previous question about how religious uh, groups or religious beliefs are affecting uh, people with, with HIV. And she comments that in her organization, in Casa de la Sal, she has accompanied people who are members of the church, like priests or nuns who live with HIV and how it's been difficult for them to access, how, how complex it is for them to access medication because of the, uh, the stigma around it and how the religious beliefs affect them even further. Y respecto a lo de indetectabilidad, eh, es muy eh, bueno que lo tengamos en México, todavía no con la cobertura amplia que quisiéramos, que se requiere, pero mencionaría nada más que la indetectabilidad en, este, eh, en esta cultura heteronormal, eh, masculina, machista, una mujer indetectable, bien podría dar a luz a su bebé sin cesárea, pero eso no aplica. Como es mujer, este, tiene que ser forzosamente con cesárea. Entonces, resumido, las mujeres indetectables en México que están embarazadas eh, podrían dar a luz eh, por parto vaginal, pero no es así. En una cultura machista tienen que dar a luz a través de la cesárea, aunque sean indetectables. She is saying how there needs to be more awareness of the message U equals U, and how in particular this affects uh, women who are pregnant, and how because of a ma macho society, a patriarchal society, even though women who are at an un undetectable level, they and they could give birth to to babies uh, via vaginal um, uh, vaginal way in a natural way they are forced to have uh, c-sections even though these shouldn't be necessary so this is another layer of um, how women are affected thank you very much uh, soko and edgar um, uh, Robert, I see you have uh, a hand raised there. So I just wanted to respond to the, the comment on um, PrEP. Um, what was the comment? PrEP um, reducing transmission um, of COVID-19 for those people that are on it. Um, there's an article on AIDS map, which is a really reliable source of information around HIV, which, which debunks that. So I've put that in the, the, the chat if anyone wants to read it. Thanks very much, Robert. That's, that's, uh, that's very interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll be looking at that uh, later this evening. Um, now, uh, I'm conscious that, that we, we are uh, just kind of coming up to uh, 20 past uh, seven now. Um, so I think, uh, um, uh, I'd just like to uh, to thank all of the, the panel members um, for their valuable contributions and discussions uh, this evening. Um, I'd like to thank all of our, our audience uh, for, for joining us and also uh, uh, all of my fellow committee members who, who have been a massive help in, in uh, organizing this event. Um, now, just before uh, letting everyone head off to 
to um, uh, enjoy the rest of their evening or, or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I, I just wanted to flag that uh, our next event uh, will be taking place in a couple of weeks time on the 16th of December. Um, this is a seminar event that, uh, that uh, my, my committee member Edgar has uh, been driving uh, with uh, Gina Gwenfrawi as part of uh, and as part of that research seminar series, Gina is going to be discussing representations of trans women in Americas through the prism of neoliberal society. Uh, so I think uh, we will be circulating, uh, we'll be circulating uh, links to that. Uh, so, so please do uh, join if that's something you would be uh, interested in, in uh, attending. Um, I, I just also uh, wanted to uh, flag for, for those of us who, who are um, in Edinburgh at the moment, um, and if you do fancy uh, getting out um, for, for some fresh air, um, uh, I'm informed that, uh, that uh, we, we have a, a number of uh, university buildings uh, lit up in, in uh, recognition of uh, World AIDS Day, uh, New College, uh, McEwen Hall, uh, TV and Appleton Tower. Um, so I just wanted to share that with everyone. Um, and again, thank you, thank you so much uh, for for making this a really, uh, really interesting event. Thank you. Good to see everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Muchas gracias, muchas gracias eh, por haber participado desde México y bueno, D David ya eh, dio un agradecimiento por haber estado aquí, por esta participación tan, tan maravillosa y, y por haber hecho este evento increíble. Muchas gracias, gracias. por la invitación. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias. Thanks. Saludos, Pati, Rocío. Pati, hola, Soco. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Bye.